Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to 5 by 15. I hope you all had a restful and rejuvenating long weekend, and we're so pleased to be back with you tonight. We have a really special lineup for you this evening. Five exciting writers and thinkers who will be speaking to us about some fundamental themes, about life on our planet, about time and how we mark it, space and how we divide it, about the relationship between humans and animals, stories of family, society and art. As usual, all of our speakers' books are on sale this evening from our wonderful bookshop partner, Newham Bookshop, and you'll find the relevant information about how to buy them in the chat. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Tim Marshall. Tim Marshall is a journalist and broadcaster with more than 30 years of reporting experience, and he's a leading authority in foreign affairs. He's been diplomatic editor for Sky News and before that worked at the BBC and LBC, and he's covered conflicts all over the world. He's the author of numerous best-selling books, including The Power of Geography and Prisoners of Geography. His gripping new book, The Future of Geography, looks at the new geopolitical realities of the world we live in, how we got here and where we're going. Tim, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, thank you to Five Times Fifteen for the opportunity uh, to, to give a, hopefully a relatively brief talk. Um, Jack's gonna do the uh, screen sharing for me because I passed the age of 30 a couple of years back and uh, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I'd like to tell a story uh, in 12 minutes. And it starts as the book does with the Big Bang. Now the core of this book is about astropolitics, which I'll come to, but I thought I'm not gonna miss the opportunity to sort of gaze into the into the distance and, and stroke my, my, my beard and sort of talk meaningfully because I, I just couldn't resist it because it is actually part of the story. Um, looking up at the sky, it's what we've always done uh, from the moment we were sentient and we've looked up and of course there wasn't the light pollution. We've looked up and we've asked ourselves questions and we used to see that. And when you look at it long enough without light pollution, you start noticing things and patterns. I think we're programmed to see patterns. But of course, we also ask the question why? And from a very, very long time ago, we used the sky as some of our answers. And those flickering lights, they, they told so many stories to us. They were wrong, most of them, but they are part and parcel of what we are now. The, the Finns, for example, in Finland, what we call the Northern Lights, they call foxfires because their explanation for what was going on was that there was a giant fox and it used its giant tail and it swept the snow up into the air, into the sky, and that's what they were. They were, they were foxfires. And in some parts of Africa, people said that at nighttime, the sun had gone behind this curtain and the stars, um, they, they thought that these were holes in this curtain that the light was coming through and the, this is entirely explicable normal things to think but then comes science um, from a very long way back you could say as much as 30,000 years back when we started noticing patterns and we started tracking things and, and trying to try to see where, where are we and what is going on and why and you can take it to 30,000 years ago, you can take it to 12,000 years ago, because at that point we stopped being hunter-gatherers. And if you're fixed in one place, it helps to have a look at the sky and work out when you're going to plant your seeds and harvest. You can fast forward onto the Babylonians, the Egyptians, who were working off a 10-day week, I think it's worth pointing out. So I'm very glad that science worked out this is the Hebrews we can thank for a weekend. They worked out the seven day week because if God said he wanted to rest on the seventh day, we could have one as well. Uh, the Greeks, probably the greatest uh, fast forward launching of science onto Islam's golden age. And then we get to the enlightenment and another acceleration. And then to get where we are now, I'd like to introduce you to another man, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. This is a Russian guy who left school at 14 uneducated, self-educated, I should say. And several years before Kitty Hawk, the first plane that flew, took off, he was, he was uh, drawing airlocks for spaceships to dock space um, suits to, to, to live in outside of spaceships. He uh, was working out solar panels in space. 
And he's the guy that worked out escape velocity. And escape velocity is the relationship that changes between the rocket that's going up and its mass as it sheds part of the rocket and the amount of fuel, fuel you need and the speed required to escape. And without him, none of the rest would have happened. And he's an unknown figure, except in Russia, I think. Um, and he should be better known. And then we move into the 20th century, and that's when things really start to get going, because in the 20th century, we send a machine up for the first time. The Germans, uh, as they were testing the V2 rocket, were the first ones to break the atmosphere. And then we began to orbit as well. And I thought it was uh, also uh, interesting that one of the things I came across in writing the book was uh, the countdown, because the, the Americans use this very dramatic 10, 9, 8, and it's great, and it's what we're completely used to. And then I found out that the Russians just said, what time is it? And pressed a button and said, let's go. There was no countdown. And the reason is, if we go to the next um, frame, was that von Braun, who was the German rocket scientist who did the V2 rockets, and the Americans then got hold of him and took him to America, where he ended up on the Disney Channel, but that's another story. He'd been to see a film in the 1920s, a silent movie by Fritz Lang. Now, most of us know Metropolis. There's another one, Frau im, im Mon, um, of the woman in the moon. And to heighten the dramatic effect, he did the countdown. And hopefully, as you can see from this clip, So I think we can agree it's, it's better with a countdown, isn't it? And it was very dramatic, but the, to this day, the Russians don't really do that. So here we are now with astropolitics. We've got up, we're out, we've got the satellites, we've been to the moon, we're going back to the moon. So that, this is the core of the book. And I try to explain space through geography. Now, in geopolitics, you take uh, distance, uh, volume of trade, rivers, mountains, what you can do and what you can't do. And you use it as the bedrock to understand a country and to understand uh, international relations and, and what are the possibilities of a country. So I took that template and used it with space because space has strategic corridors that you want. It's got places that you don't want, the Van Allen radiation belts, for example. Um, there are parts of the moon which are far more valuable because that's where the water is, the South Pole, for example. There's lots of rare earth materials There's on the moon. There's silicon, uh, lithium, etc., titanium. So those are the bits that you want, and those are the bits you don't want. So I use that, that geography to explain what's going on. Um, if we look at the this map of space, a fairly rough one, you can see low Earth orbit, for example. Now, that's a really useful bit of real estate. It's so important now that that's where all our satellites are that you can't afford not to be there. It's important for military, it's important for commerce. And you have to be there if you're a major player. Geosynchronous orbit, this is where uh, your machine will turn at the same speed as the Earth. And so consequently, you're over the same spot all the time. Very, very useful. And this leads me to the next slide, which is the negative side of things. And that's that I'm afraid we're taking all our problems that we have here up to space. And it mirrors, it mirrors what is happening here. What's happening here is there are blocks emerging in the world, the American-led block, China with Russia as a junior partner and other blocks. And we're taking that a bit of space and we don't have the laws to cope with this. There are, there's a couple of treaties from the 60s and 70s, but they're 50, 60 years out of date. They don't have the technology in them for what is happening now. So for example, now some of the satellites are used for early nuclear warning in case somebody's launched, but there's no law to say how far away someone else's satellite is from your satellite. And nowadays, to clear space debris, you have satellites with grappling arms that can get hold of a satellite. Other ways is to attack satellites by dazzling them and burning out their electrics. And we don't have the laws for this. And I think we urgently, urgently need them. We don't have the laws about the moon. Everyone agrees in theory 
that we uh, no one country can own territory out there. But the reality is, and this is with the Artemis Accords, the American-led Artemis Accords, they're going back in 2025, they're going to land a man and a woman on the moon. And by 2032, they want a moon base there and they want the minerals and so does everybody else. So by what law, if they have, as they have in the Artemis Accords, Article 11, a self-declared safety zone, by what law do you then say, well, you can't come and land anywhere near me. I spent all this money finding where the uh, metals are, we're digging them up. There are no laws. And so we urgently need new space laws. Go to the last uh, slide. This is a vision of the future. We can 3D print. We've already 3D printed um, tools, mechanical tools in, in, on the space station. We can 3D, 3D print a moon base. We will. We're going to do all these things, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic. And I'm very energized as a nerd about these things. But I do, I do worry that the, there's an arms race already going on up there. We've already, four countries have shot down one of their own satellites to test whether that such a thing can be done. The Russians have test fired something, we're not sure what, from one of their satellites, which hit another one of their satellites. And as I said, we don't have the rules. Musk, Elon Musk is trying to make them. Uh, he said, um, one of his best lines actually said, I want to um, I want to die on Mars, but just not on impact. He says he's going to have a million people there by 2050. I think that's fantasy. But the fact is that he will get there. His, SpaceX will get there. And if you were to subscribe to Starlink, his, his satellite system and his terminals for the internet, you actually sign in the uh, terms and conditions that he and his company is in charge on Mars. That's forward thinking. We need laws. So there's so much more I could say, and there's so much more negative, but I'd like to end on some positive notes. The medical experiments that are already going on are fantastic. Uh, the potential for free, clean nuclear energy are there. Free, clean solar energy beamed back to Earth. It's all there. But the real thing we're gonna do is what we've always done, and that's look to the high mountain sail out into the ocean without even knowing what's on the other side of the ocean. That's the real impetus uh, behind all this. And it's going to be Homo Spacian that finds it. And I'll leave you with a joke. I am told that um, my new book, if you, if you read it in zero gravity, you just can't put it down. Thank you so much, Tim, for that. That's wonderful. For our next speaker, we'll be moving from questions of space to questions of time. And I'm delighted to introduce Jenny O'Dell, a multidisciplinary artist and author who joins us tonight from California. Jenny's first book, The Much Loved How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, was a New York Times bestseller and offered new and galvanizing ways of thinking about our place in the world in an oversaturated digital era. In her second book, Saving Time, which is out now, Jenny O'Dell turns her attention to the clock and examines how we got to the point where time became money. There is inspiration to be taken, the new book suggests, in looking to pre-industrial, ecological and geological rhythms. Jenny, we're so pleased to have you with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so, yes, appropriate to the subject of time, it is morning here in Oakland, in California. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of ideas from my book, Saving Time. Um, and maybe just sort of contextualize it by saying that I, I consider it to be most of all a book about language, um, the language that we use to think about and talk about time. Um, and it was also motivated by my desire to find a relationship to time that didn't feel painful, um, whether that meant time pressure, sort of daily time pressure, climate dread, or just the simple fact of mortality that I only have so much time. Um, and so that's that's kind of what I set out uh, to think about when I wrote this book. Um, I want to give here just two sort of brief examples of two very different ways of thinking about time in order to kind of make that contrast more uh, more obvious. Um, so the, the first is just sort of time is money. It's a very familiar phrase. Um, and uh, I think sometimes when we say time is money, we actually just mean um, time is important, time is of the essence. Um, 
as humans, we have always needed to be attentive to time and use it wisely um, in order to survive. So there's nothing new about that. Um, what I was sort of interested in thinking about more was the the more literal concept of time as money. Um, literally, time is something that can be bought and sold, um, typically the time of other people. Um, and so, and and with that, the idea of time as abstract stuff. So it's abstracted from natural cues. Um, and so I think what I really mean is sort of man hours or labor hours that are divorced from places and from individuals. Um, and I think, you know, for some people it's a familiar history, but I do think it is worth kind of going to the root of that idea because it's something that we, um, just sort of, you know, either take for granted or just really live with that language of time. Um, for me, it was really interesting to revisit the history of how something like canonical hours in monasteries, um, which were not necessarily equal hours yet, um, but definitely showed some sort of cultural emphasis on punctuality and, and regular work, um, spread into rapidly commercializing, you know, European towns that had a new need to count and measure labor hours that were being bought, um, and then how that was also exported um, via colonists to places with a very different understanding of time. Um, and something that I really, uh, I found really fascinating were accounts where, uh, accounts of encounters between, you know, colonists and um, people living in these places where it's sort of like a language barrier. Um, you have one sense of time that's very task oriented, things take the time that they take. And then you have another where um, regular hours, regular work hours are really prized. And then you have one where uh, there's a deep attentiveness to natural cues and the other actually sees um, removal from natural cues as being a sign of modernity. Um, and there's, um, a, there's a historian, Caitlin Rosenthal, who's written a really fascinating book on how the, the documents, some of the earliest documents that we would describe as spreadsheets were used on plantations. Um, again, to measure and count labor, labor days in this case. But, um, you know, in some of these cases, plantation owners were using pre-printed work logs or books um, that were not only meant to count the hours, but were also part of a system to intensify that work. So there was no sort of effort to count the hours without an attempt to also intensify that work and sort of get more productivity out of people. Um, so I am going to share my screen now and see this. Okay. So, um, these are some ads that I found in uh, a publication called factory magazine from the early 20th century. And, um, and I think, you know, kind of moving forward in history, that way of thinking about time is obviously the kind of time that was used or thought about in something like Taylorism, which you may be familiar with, but is essentially just uh, a system for codifying work and breaking it up into very small, very timeable segments in order, again, to make it go faster. Also to, you know, it results in a worker having a smaller kind of more rote job that they're doing over and over again. And I think in these ads, which are addressed to a factory owner, you can really see like, a very literal uh, version of time is money. Um, but this didn't just apply to the industrial world. Already around that time, there were books um, trying to apply uh, Taylorism and scientific management to the office. And one of my favorite examples is where they tried to time how long it takes to punch a time card in which identify a card was timed as 0 0.0156 seconds and get time card from rack was 0 0.0246 seconds. So you can really see this like minute um, timing of these things. And uh, although this seems like something from the past, it's it's very much still with us, um, whether that is um, employee tracking software that's installed on remote workers' laptops, um, telematic systems that are used in delivery trucks that can see every move they make and when they you know use their seatbelt and when they don't. Um, and then I also think of the scanner guns that are used in Amazon warehouses, which are both directing the worker and timing them. Um, and when I think about this legacy of this way of thinking about time, I think about this short film called Merger by Keiichi Matsuda. It's a 360 film, and it's this woman who's basically working alone in, a, in something like a personalized assembly line, struggling to keep up with these um, prompts and pop-ups and messages. And you can see in the background, she's being kind of surveilled by an evil version of Microsoft Clippy, the, the paperclip. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that's worth noting that you can see in this example is that although not everyone's experience of time on the job is like this, 
it for those um, who do, I think it cuts across what we would describe as white collar and blue collar work. Um, and so that's one one way of thinking about time. Um, the second that I want to contrast that with is something that I would um, maybe describe with a term from the geologist Marcia Bjornerud, um, and that's timefulness. So she uses timefulness um, in order as a geologist to talk about how when a geologist looks at a landscape, they see the past in the present. I This is an image of Pescadero. Um, it's a beach not too far from here that I use in the book as a way to illustrate this kind of thinking about time. Um, and uh, notes here. Um, and so you can see, yeah, you can see what happened, but also you can think about the fact that the identity of any particular rock literally is what happened to it. If you look up any kind of rock, the description will be, you know, it was, it got subducted, there was a presence of water, there was this kind of mineral, right? There is no identity of a rock without its past. Um, and so I, in the book, I, I have an image of these pebbles from this beach and I, and I ask the reader to sort of look at them and consider that they're not signs or symbols of time, but they actually are in a way time itself. Um, the other example that I use is, um, oh, sorry, let's see. Uh, oh, I don't have time to talk about that. Sorry. I forgot about that in there. So, uh, I talk about a buckeye tree in my neighborhood and, um, it's a California buckeye tree. It has a kind of interesting schedule. It goes dormant for a lot of the year. And then uh, in the spring, things start happening really fast. And uh, right now is actually a very exciting time to be looking at the buckeye tree. But essentially, you know, it's something that I walked past hundreds of times during the pandemic. And I found that I actually really needed at that time an illustration of time that was dynamic and that was nonlinear because pandemic time felt very um, kind of stultifying, like every day was the same, time is undifferentiated, right? Um, and so I described this exercise of choosing a thing and paying attention to it in order to be able to see the change in it as unfreezing something in time as sort of like a mental exercise. And one of the things that happens when you do that is that the, the agency of the non-human world becomes more visible to you, um, sort of aliveness of the world. And I find that an interesting effect of that is that I, I'm sort of reminded also of my own aliveness and my own agency and that I'm not you know, simply a person, a repository of labor hours who's living out a script, um, but that I actually have the potential for unexpected actions um, and responses to the world. Um, and so, as you can imagine, I took a lot of inspiration from Indigenous scholars in in particularly thinking about this way of, of reckoning time. Um, and uh, one of the things I really valued about that perspective is um, there are many examples of place-based timing. So um, Tyson Yunkaporta, who is an Aboriginal author, has written about um, a tree in Australia that the Aboriginal name is is the same as the word for eel. Its grain, the wood grain, is similar to eel meat, and it flowers in the peak fat season for eels, and eel fat is a medicine for fevers um, in that season. So all of those things the sort of the tree and the place where it is and the time are all bound up together. Um, another example from Vine Deloria Jr., who is a um, Standing Rocks U writer who is based in the U.S., um, he wrote about tribes who lived along the Missouri River who would plant corn in the valley and then go up into the mountains, um, seemingly abandoning it. Um, but they, there was a plant up there that they knew when the seed pods reached a certain uh, stage of maturity, it was time to go down and harvest the corn. So it was basically acting like a clock. And so I think there are these really exquisite examples of timing uh, as, as opposed to the idea of time as abstract stuff. Um, and for me, it's a reminder um, not to see clock time as fundamental, but rather just one language of many that we can and have used for time. Um, and that every system we've had for reckoning time has, has uh, accompanied some specific end obviously with time is money, that would be capitalism and, and profit. Um, and so I, I've just compared those two forms of time. Um, why is that contrast important to me? Um, there are a couple of reasons. One is that I just find personally that linear standardized time lends itself to an individualistic understanding of time in which I have my time units in my time bank, you have your time units in your time bank, all we can do is exchange them on the market and they exist in a zero sum game. Um, and I think that that definitely obscures avenues that we might have towards more collective action that would liberate more time for more people and would also help us um, 
imagine taking more action against uh, the climate crisis. Um, and the second kind of simpler uh, reason is kind of what I mentioned before. I find that um, paying attention to the agency in nature reawakens us potentially to our own agency. Um, and, you know, a lot of what I was trying to do in writing this book was simply reawaken my appetite and the reader's appetite for the future and to see it not as a foregone conclusion, especially with the climate, but as, um, you know, a field of possibilities. We know some things will happen, but we don't we don't know exactly what will happen and we should respond to that actively. Um, and so just to kind of close out uh, a couple of sort of prompts to sort of leave you with, um, I invite you to pay attention to ways that you reckon time outside of the clock, um, whether that is through bodily rhythms, through seasons. Um, I know for me personally, um, yesterday I went to actually the same park that that tree is in and the cherry blossom trees had seemingly blossomed overnight and everybody was just gawking at these trees and they were blossoming more than I've ever seen because of all of that rain that we've had here in California. Um, so that's that would be my example, but um, you, you, you have your own. Um, I also invite you to consider what happens to the ways that you think about work obligations and relationships when you think about time in a less individualistic way. So not your time and my time, but our time. Um, and maybe not, you know, thinking instead of trying to wring the most value out of your individual hours, thinking more instead about giving help and getting help in a network. Um, and lastly, um, after having thought through those two, um, see what it does for your own sense of agency, um, for what feels possible for you, not as, for example, a consumer who buys green, um, but as an actor in the world with hopes and dreams for a better future. Um, and that together with others, you might be capable of actions that you can't even imagine currently. So I leave you with those and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jenny, for your time and, and for re reawakening our sense of, of what time is and those different forms and and for those prompts that we can use to pay attention in different ways. Uh, for our next speaker, we move from thinking about time into the corridors and galleries of a New York institution. Our third speaker, Patrick Bringley, formerly worked for the editorial events office at The New Yorker and later decided to take a job as a guard in the galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which he did for 10 years. Patrick's new book, All the Beauty in the World, is a moving memoir about what it means to find solace and meaning in artworks and the places that house them. Patrick, thank you so much and over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, let me share my screen before I do anything else. But yes, as Jack said, um, I worked for a decade as a guard at the Met. And before I tell you who I am and how I ended up there, I want to bring you to the Met itself. So we imagine we approach from East 82nd Street here, and you've got this facade that's so wide that no matter where you're standing, you can't get the whole thing into view. And this is kind of emblematic of the Met as a whole. I spent 2,000 days standing in these galleries, but I might have spent 10,000 days, and I wouldn't be able to wrap my mind around the place. But I'll tell you what I see sort of as a guard. I think to myself, well, down the south there at 80th Street, you've got the parking garage entrance. Um, all the way at 84th Street, four blocks to the north, you've got the loading dock entrance. In between, you've got this sweep of marble stairs that ascend from, you know, the grimy mean streets of New York into this great temple of art. I can tell you as a guard, we don't climb those stairs. You enter by the loading dock. You pass um, one of my colleagues in a sentry booth here who's checking in big white trucks that might be carrying paintings on loan from the Louvre, or they might be carrying hot dog buns for the cafeteria, you can't be sure. You walk that ramp down and down and down into the Met's vast backstage. So the Met sits on 12 acres of Central Park. You can imagine that just as big as it is above ground, it is exactly as big underground. I would boop in my credentials and I would walk these concrete floors with duct work and wiring overhead and these yield to art and transit signs as people push things by and push carts. Um, and I'd be passing wood shops and plexiglass shops. There's a printer, there's an armory for when, you know, a helmet goes on the fritz. There's uh, conservation studios, there's storage facilities. But where I'm headed is a locker room for more than 500 Metropolitan Museum of Art guards. This is just a tiny fraction of them. 
I push in, you know, there's conversations going on in a half dozen languages in the locker room. I get on my stiff polyester dark blue suit, head over to the dispatch office. And they look at me and they say, Bringley, you know, section H today, which means I'm going to Egypt or section K1, which means I'm going to Greece or Rome. Um, let's imagine that it is one of my first days on the job when I was sent most often to section B, which was my home section, the old master paintings. I would get assigned uh, my posts for the day and I would get on post um, about a half an hour before we opened to the public and it would be church mouse quiet. And the only sound that I would hear is my footfalls on these wonderfully soft wooden floors. I noticed that in the UK, you, you let guards sit sometimes. In America, we don't do that. Um, so it makes a difference over these eight and 12 hour days. And it would be wonderful because it would just be me and the Goyas, me and the Rembrandts, me and Helena, uh, Rubens's wife that you see there on the right. And a wonderful thing about being a guard, um, you have all this time and there's no one to bring you that back down to earth. You can use that time, as Jenny was talking about, any way that you want to think about these kind of vivid presences any way you want. And sometimes they feel like your companions because you're spending all day with them. And other times they look like windows onto these very strange sometimes and other times very familiar sort of worlds. Um, one place I was posted very often were what I think of as the Jesus pictures. Um, that's a, in honor of a man he was walking through. He's probably looking for sunflowers by Van Gogh or he's looking for water lilies. And he, he gets to yet another gallery like this. And he said, God damn it, I'm in the Jesus pictures again. Um, I have to say, though, though I'm not a Christian myself, I adored working in these paintings. Um, you know, you have a painting like this, it's made in the 14th century. If you know anything about the 14th century, you know that that was a hard luck century. Maybe a third of Europe died in the bubonic plague. Uh, Bernardo Dadi, who painted this, likely died in the, Bernard, in the um, bubonic plague. And it makes sense, right, that at that time, you would be thinking about the passion, which is just an old word that means suffering. And to be amidst all these pictures, it seems like the old masters took a huge range of emotions and telescoped them into this one story of this one man from first century Judea and his short life. And as a guard, I got to just bear witness to it. You know, I wasn't a curator who had to study it. I wasn't a tourist who had to take a picture of it and gallop on to the next thing. I was a witness as much as one of these um, figures in the periphery of this Fra Angelico picture. And with all that time, um, with all that space, I found incredible solace in it. Because here's where I should say a bit about myself. So I started as a guard. I was just 25 years old. Previously, I had had a more kind of prestigious job. Um, I was working uh, at a, a skyscraper at the corner of 42nd Street and Broadway for the New Yorker magazine. I was just 22 years old when I got that job. So, of course, you know, I felt I was at the center of the world. Never mind that I, I wasn't writing for the magazine. I was in the events department. I couldn't have written because what, what did I know at 22 years old? What had I lived? But, you know, it felt it felt like something. But then while I was working there, my brother, Tom, who was two years older, got sick and he got very sick um, with what's called a soft tissue sarcoma. Turned out not to be the sort of thing that you're going to beat. Um, and I was not in, you know, New York City for me wasn't so much midtown Manhattan. It was Tom's apartment in Queens and it was hospital rooms, um, Beth Israel Hospital. And it was very clear that very heart-stoppingly momentous, beautiful, painful things were going on in those quiet little rooms. And it made it just as clear that kind of the nonsense and the office politics and the ladder climbing that was going on in the skyscraper at 42nd Street and Broadway seemed neither here nor there. Um, so when, when Tom died, I, I wanted to do something nourishing. I wanted to do something straightforward. Um, and I picked as my venue kind of the most beautiful place I could think of. I was sort of speechless in a way, and I, I wanted to remain so. And I got to be speechless around pictures like this, which obviously reminded me very 
directly of um, my particular experience, but just reminds us of the human experience, more or less. I mean, you, you have in pictures like this, these are from the same unknown master from Naples. Um, on the left, that's an adoration. On the right, that's cut from a lamentation. And these are two primary essential emotions, adoration and lamentation. And how beautiful is it that these two pictures look like they could have been part of the same scene? I mean, I think these are two sides of coin. I think any of us who has been around someone who's suffering with maybe great bravery or sort of an admirable simplicity knows that your heart kind of brims at the same time as your heart breaks because it's very beautiful, but it's also very painful. There's something fundamental, poignant. It's like you've reached kind of bedrock of human existence. Um, and it seems like the old masters sometimes are painting that bedrock. That's kind of the feeling I get. But what was remarkable about the job is I wasn't just working there. You know, the next day I'd be sent to ancient Egypt. And the following day, I'd spend 12 hours in the Islamic thing. And then maybe I'd round out the day with eight hours in the African art. And kind of the more time I spent there, the more years I spent there, the more I became convinced that, you know, the Met, of course, is a museum of art, but it's not a museum about art. It's a museum about everything. It's a museum about life and death and about the glory of creation and the splendor of and the mystery and the diversity and the cosmos, but also intimate little moments. And what is all that? What is all this and, you know, I got to contemplate this stuff just day in and day out. And I would try to tell people as they asked me questions, you know, one thing about working as a guard is you're not working in just among artworks, 7 million people come into the Met every year and they would see me and I look approachable in sort of my dark blue suit. And they'd ask me for the Mona Lisa and they'd ask me for the dinosaurs, but they'd also, you know, ask me to introduce them to this stuff. And I would tell them, well, we're here to learn about art, but we're also here to learn from it. And you can you you are qualified to weigh in on these big questions that that artworks raise and that life raises. When it comes to people, I just want to end talking about one particular person. The most extraordinary kind of collection of anything that the Met has is its guards. Five hundred guards are at the Met, and this guard is um, I call him Joseph in the book. He's from uh, West Africa, from Togo. He's holding my one-year-old son, who's now nine and upstairs from me right now. And um, I want to show you Joseph's favorite ga um, gallery in the Met, and you'll see why in a moment. This is a Ming Dynasty scholar's garden. It's called the Astra Court. Above its moon gate there, it says, in search of quietude. And it is self-consciously a world in miniature. That's what a scholar's garden is meant to be. It has mountains, it has streams, and it's meant to be a place where we go and are in this simplified place where we can kind of contemplate fundamentals. But the, the Met is a world in miniature as well. And when I, I give tours here, I like to, to end in this room. And it's a world in miniature in the sense of bringing all these cultures under the same roof. But it's also a world in miniature in that it has those 7 million people and it has 2,000 people who work there. And I'm sitting here with Joseph on his, his retirement dinner. This was just in December. He's the one on the right. And he's showing us his house that he's building in Ghana. He's going to retire half the time to Ghana. And he's showing his pictures on his iPhone. And I say, Joseph, that's the moon gate. There on the left, he is building his ode to the Astro Court, to the Chinese Scholars Garden. So here we got a guy originally from Chicago. Yeah, I'm choking up. <laughs> Here we got a guy originally from Chicago talking to a guy from Togo um, in a Chinese scholar's garden that's in New York City about the version that he is building in Ghana. And, you know, that was just daily life at the Met. That, that's what I got to do on, on a Tuesday, you know, and I felt very privileged um, to be a part of the world that offers that. And I wrote this book called All the Beauty in the World because, you know, I wanted to focus on all the artwork in that place and all the majesty and splendor in that place, but also kind of everything the solitary individual brings into it and everything that all the workers standing around gazing at the masterpieces bring to it. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. And thank you to 5 by 15. This is really cool. Thank you so much, Patrick. That really made me want to be in the Met and in that world in miniature, as you put it. Um,
Our next speaker is Colin Grant, whose six highly acclaimed books include Bad Guy at the Wheel, a memoir of growing up in 1970s Luton, and A Smell of Burning, his history of epilepsy, which was named a Sunday Times Book of the Year, and Homecoming, Voices of the Windrush Generation. Colin's new memoir, which is titled I'm Black So You Don't Have To Be, is written as a series of compelling short stories and brings together an unforgettable cast of characters from his family and illuminates what he's learned from them. We're so pleased that he's here tonight to tell us about some of those people and some of those stories. Colin, over to you. Thanks, Jack. And hello, everybody. Lovely to see you. Well, I can't see you, but it's lovely to feel that you're there. I'm going to give you a little explanation of the title first of my book, I'm Black, So You Don't Have to Be. Um, so I was born in 1961 of Jamaican parents. That same year, my uncle Castus came to the UK from Jamaica. And in my uncle's estimation, as we grew up, we were not like nephew and uncle, we were more like brothers. But in his mind, he was smarter than me. He was better looking than me. He was more charming than me. He was more erudite. But he hadn't had the breaks in life that I've had. And time and time again, he would say he'd arrived here too soon. He'd arrived so much so that he was just considered another irksome darkie. And whenever we spoke about this, he would say to me, I'm black, Colin, so you don't have to be. And he is a character who populates the book. He's throughout every chapter, more or less. And this first image here is a collage, which has been designed by my daughter, the artist, Jazz Grant. And I love this collage because it signals my time with her. She's a little girl, uh, I'm, I'm holding her hand, we're in Jamaica there, but you can see a great picture of Luton, where I'm from in the background. And you can see the Blue Caribbean Sea. Now, the book is, in essence, a family story. And uh, it really begins with my mother, who is in the next photograph. My mother, Ethelyn, uh, recognized that when I was 10, that I had good brains. And she was feeding me all the fish that she could get hold of, but it wasn't going to make any difference because I was destined for the failing state school. So she determined that I should go to a private school in order to further my chances in life. At that time, I was one of five children and she was married to this man called Bagai. And Bagai worked at Vauxhall Motors on the production line. Uh, he was a man of great charm, but he was a man that my mother shouldn't have married. But anyway, she convinced him that they would have to do something to get this boy to a private school because the failing state school wasn't gonna be good enough. So he recognized that uh, he would have difficulty earning enough money, not only to keep us all alive and in clothing and with a roof over our head, but to send me to this private school. So at this point, I always say that my education was funded by marijuana. So my father came to Britain from Jamaica with the love of ganja intact. And he recognized that all of his Caribbean friends also came with their love of ganja intact. So I was a little bag man. We'd uh, pass up these little packets of marijuana and we'd drive around Luton dropping off the marijuana and it meant that I eventually got to go to this rather expensive private school, St. Columbus College in St. Albans. Uh, I was always impressed though by the way that my father dealt with the police because often when we were stopped and we stopped quite a lot there were things in the car that all not to be there, not just the marijuana but knockoff booths from the local RAF base Lake and Heath. We'd be stopped by the equivalent of PC blogs and my father would promote him immediately. So he became detective inspector, sir, chief constable, sir. And he would be so amused that he would wave us on. Though I must tell you now, uh, that's him at, uh, at his car, it wasn't his car actually, it's, his, it's my uncle's car, that's a Ford Cortina Mark II, that's a yellow car with a chocolate top. Um, but eventually, uh, spoiler, crime doesn't pay, even though I don't think he thought he was committing a crime, he was providing a service for his Caribbean friends. He got caught, the police came, they raided the house, they dug up the front garden, they dug up the back garden, 
They rifle through all the drawers, cupboards, wardrobes, and eventually they found a huge stash of, of marijuana. Uh, I was always impressed though, by the fact that my father well, went to court, um, but the judge never sent him to jail. It meant though that my mother was rather annoyed and disappointed and embarrassed and shamed by what had happened. So eventually she showed him the door and I didn't see him uh, from the age of 12 or 13 or so. Miraculously, we, well, I was still able to go to this expensive private school. Every few months though, at the end of the term, I'd get a letter. I'd have to carry a letter home from the bursar, a letter to my mother reminding her that uh, she was late again with the rent not with the rent, with the um, fees, school fees. Um, my mother, it was a Catholic school, my mother would write back immediately saying to the person, well, what would Jesus do? So she shamed them into giving me a private school education, rather expensive education. I mean, I was an altar boy as well, and I became the head boy at that school. And But all along, I was geared towards going to medical school. When I was 10, my father sat me down on the edge of his bed and just instructed me that I was going to become a doctor. That was the plan. So everything I did was geared towards that end. Eventually, I did get to medical school, and uh, you'll see some of my chums in the next photograph, at the London Hospital in Whitechapel. This was in the early 1980s, and London was a place we knew very little about. I came from a small town called Luton, about 20 miles north of London. And there I am with my um, dragon brooch. We look like a team of snooker players there, but these are all my medical student friends. And the first thing that we did was to find accommodation. Uh, Whitechapel, though, was an area I knew very little about other than it was a bad square to land on when you played Monopoly. And when we arrived in, in Whitechapel, the Monopoly board didn't seem to be wrong. It was a sort of burnt out, Rubble was everywhere, there was corrugated iron, there was barbed wire. If you brushed too heavily alongside the walls of a house, the walls would wobble. Um, and it was a rather peculiar place to be because we were schooled in pathology. So the first thing you do at, at medical school is to dissect a cadaver. Your first patient is a dead patient. You spend a year dissecting a cadaver. And you spend a year learning pathology. And we were taught to think pathology all the time. Think pathology, think pathology. You're walking down Whitechapel High Street. You see a man who's bent over. He has a mirror in his hand. Half his nose is missing. What's that? Oh, that's tertiary syphilis. You're walking down Brick Lane. A Bengali woman hops into the pavement. There's blood in her sputum. What's that? Oh, that's tuberculosis. So we thought of people as just walking pathology or well, the potential to be walking pathology. And it took a while to change your outlook from thinking of people as pathology, as people who are worthy of pathos. In that very first year, also a pathologist gave us a lecture where he talked about the fact that in Britain, the percentage of the people who have schizophrenia is 1%, 1% of the population has schizophrenia. Amongst young black boys and girls though, the percentage of schizophrenia is 6%. There's six times more incidence of schizophrenia than they ought to be. And the pathologist turned to me in this big lecture hall and asked me directly why I thought this would be the case. And I was too embarrassed and didn't really know what the answer might be anyway. Eventually he said very coldly, that's because black people are schooled in paranoia. And to a degree, he wasn't wrong because when I was growing up in Luton, in this Jamaican migrant household, my father had a mantra, which he rolled out to us all the time. And the mantra was that you're being watched. You're being watched to see which way you turn. You're being watched to see whether the host country believes you to be destined for a, a life of criminality, to be feckless, work shy, etc. So confound their expectations, show your best face to the world. He encourages to have a kind of bella figura. And also what he was saying was, um, don't let people know what you really think. Mask yourself so that you can't be targeted. And it, it's akin to another um, strategy that's used by Jamaicans actually, it's called 
play fool to catch wise, which is a strategy employed by the enslaved people in the time of slavery in the Caribbean. If you feared the master's wrath or the driver's whip, it was best to play fool, to, to become or to project yourself as more of an idiot, more of a simpleton than you actually were in order to disabuse people of the notion that you constituted a threat. And that was a strategy that we employed. And I think a lot of Caribbean people, a lot of black people employed when I was growing up. Um, and it meant that when I left medical school, because medical school wasn't a very good fit for me, actually, I was st stuck it out for five long years, but eventually I left and managed to persuade the BBC uh, to give me a job. I joined the BBC in the early 1990s. And this next photograph is a photograph of me outside of Bush House, which is the headquarters or was the headquarters of the BBC World Service. And it was a great place to be because it introduced you to a kind of United Nations of people. And you recognize that you are bigger as a unit than the kind of parochial mindset of some of the more domestic services. And I played fool to catch wise in the BBC. I dialed down my color. That's another thing that you might hear, dialing down your color. And that's to, um, again, to enable people to see you and not see your color. So you dial down your color, you might even start whistling, I don't know, whistling Beethoven, or quote from Schopenhauer, or try to give people the idea that you have the same cultural reference points as they, and that you are, but for the color of your skin, you're just like them. And I dialed down my color quite unashamedly, I think for the first few years in the BBC, I was in the BBC for more than 20 years, and it was rather lovely. Uh, the only time you got to trouble with it is when you came outside of the BBC. I had a job at one point where I was tasked with writing what the papers say um, for the next morning's edition. So you get the editions at 10 p.m. The shift started at 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. And you would uh, finish by 4 p.m. I had a flat in Wapping and Bush House is based on the Strand. And it meant that you could actually drive into London. It's very quiet at 10 p.m. and park outside a Bush House and then get into your car at the end of your shift, drive down to the embankment, do a left, get to Wapping. I had a nice Capri, actually, not, not, a, not a Cortina, but a Capri. I had a peppermint green Capri with a chocolate top. But each time I drove, once a month, I'd be stopped by the police. It got so bad that I would go the other way. I would go up to Holborn, over to Clerkenwell, Shoreditch, and then down to Wapping. It added another 10 minutes on the drive, but it saved the hassle until one night I thought to myself I'm just going to go the quickest way home I'm just going to risk it so I got into my car I drove down to the embankment bang stopped by the police and the two policemen one black one white they always give the bad stuff to the black policeman to do and I remember asking him in a very shirty way what's the problem here officer and he said well there are cobwebs on your bumper and I remember thinking cobwebs on my bumper I, I started to repeat this phrase again and again and again I was getting a bit more irate, and suddenly I heard a voice in my head. It said, what would the bad guy say? And I said, well, Detective Inspector. And the police constable said, who are you calling Detective Inspector, mate? And I said, who are you calling mate, mate? And what I hadn't recognized that uh, my father was a humble, working-class Jamaican, who sounded such. I sounded like a middle-class twat who was patronizing this policeman. So sometimes you can't learn the lessons um, to good effect that your parents might impart. But I want to tell you about what really happened to me finally. I reached the point in my life at the BBC where I forgot that I was supposed to dial down my colour. I was supposed to play fool to catch wise. And there came a time in the BBC where the BBC parachuted into various departments, managers who had no experience of the people that they were managing. And on one occasion, a manager came in and we were all working in very discreet offices, four people to an office, rather civilised setting. And she came in and decided that she would um, knock down all the walls and make everything open plan. And she called for a, a meeting of all the producers, I was the radio producer, and she came in with the plans and she went round the table of 15 producers and asked them all their opinion about these plans. And it being the BBC, people are very timid actually. And they just mumbled, most of the people just mumbled something incomprehensible until it came to me. And I said, oh, I don't like open plan. It reminds me of the slave plantation with the slave master in the big house looking over the enslaved people. And most people laughed, but a few days later, 
a week later, I, I got an invitation to a disciplinary hearing where I was accused of being aggressive. And I was rather shocked and alarmed and disappointed by that because um, my parents had screamed and saved and sent me to a private school. I've been the I've been an old boy for seven years. I've been a head boy at junior school, head boy at senior school, been at medical school. I was an establishment material, but that counted for nothing. So eventually I, I was in, investigated for about six months and they interviewed everybody that I ever worked with. And one of the peculiar things that happens is that you turn into a character from a Kafka novel, like a character in the trial or from a George Orwell novel. And the interrogator, the uh, independent interrogator, started off by asking me to describe three words that would characterize me. And I'd say, well, I'm not playing this game. But eventually I said, okay, I'm tall and I'm black. And she said, and? And aggressive? And I said, no, no, I'm not going to answer to that word. That's a word that's been used to describe people like me over the decades, over the centuries. After six long months, after six months of sleeplessness, I was summoned back to the BBC and my interrogator held out the sheet of paper and read out verdict. Thank you so much, Colin, that was wonderful. Thank you for being with us. Our final speaker this evening is Frida Hughes. She's here to tell us about what we can learn from the connections with our non-human friends. Frida is a painter, a poet, and the author of several children's books and eight collections of poetry. She was formerly the poetry columnist for The Times, and she regularly exhibits her paintings in London and at a permanent exhibition at her private gallery in Wales. Her new book, George, a magpie memoir, tells the story of what happened when she moved to the depths of the Welsh countryside found herself rescuing a baby magpie cast her way by a spawn, uh, a storm. Frida, over to you. Thank you very much, Jack, and thank you, 515, for having me on. Um, my story in Wales began as I escaped seven years in London, having come back from Australia, Western Australia. Sometimes in weather like this, I have a storm outside that you can't see. I wonder why I'm actually back. This is a picture of George. This is my sketch of George when I found him in the garden, having buried both his siblings after the storm, very like the one I've got here, um, broke the nest and destroyed it. And the parents then deserted, deserted the nest altogether. Obviously, there wasn't anything left to, to look after. Um, George saved his own life by screeching as I was about to bisect him with a shovel. I was in the middle of building a dream that I had had for my entire life, actually. Um, and it was the garden. It was um, the secret garden. The secret garden used to be one of my favorite stories. And I had moved to Mid Wales in 2004 and found George in 2007, by which time the garden was really well on its way. And uh, I was creating circular rooms of flower beds, growing things tall, shipping in rocks, mixing cement and concrete, building walls. And uh, this, this became my daily obsession. And this book is about, um, I, I don't, maybe not the word obsession. Oh yes, it is, it's, it's obsession. It's also passion. It's also um, loving doing certain things. It's also loving creatures, loving nature. Um, I had really, I felt, fallen on my feet in many ways. I felt, I still feel incredibly lucky to be here. Um, and then there's this little scrap who entered my life at a point where I had three little Maltese terriers and a husband, which um, I don't have the terriers or the husband anymore. The terriers lived long and happy lives. Um, the ex-husband is still living a long and happy life. <laughs> Um, but Wales, where I wanted to put down roots, wasn't where he wanted to stay. And in fact, I was sort of at the point where I found George trying to keep things moving along because I could sense his unease and I didn't want to look at it. So George, George became a very welcome distraction. By the time this photo was taken, that's my, my very scruffy shoe there, um, George was all of two months old. He feathered up so fast and he developed a, a sort of intellect at such a prodigious rate that I started keeping a diary. In fact, I kept a diary from day one. I keep a diary anyway. And he just entered the diary and took it over. And the book is based on that diary. 
And the reason it's taken so long to, to get to publication now is because, unfortunately, after I had written the diary and started turning it into a bit more of a book, then there was you know, the end of the marriage and then life, death, life got in the way. And, um, and so it took me a while to gather my wits and, and reprise it and bring him you know, back to life. And well, he, <laughs> he might still be, um, he'd be very old by now. Um, here he's two months old. He is now a nuisance. He's, he's flying, he's the most fabulous nuisance. This is a bird that would sit by my plate and steal food or steal peas and tuck the peas in my back pocket. This is a bird that when I try to hide doggy treats in between a stack of identically folded, identical tea, tea towels by the sink, watched and then popped up on the draining board and I could swear he was counting. I'm, I'm probably imagining it, but he studied that pile of towels, stuck his head in between exactly the right towels, pulled out the bag of doggy treats, which was had a slit in it, pulled it out, dropped it on the floor, took this huge flat shaped doggy treat out, tormented the dogs with it, flew around the kitchen with it, and then dropped it in the toaster because it was a perfect fit. So, George related to things that I did. The dogs would pad around, wait to be fed, um, want to engage, want cuddles. George wanted to be with them, wanting cuddles, wanting attention, especially if I was on the phone. If I was on the phone, he was on my foot, and I strongly suspect I was on the phone when I took this photo. Um, but he related in a way that the dogs couldn't, and that's that was like a little hook in my heart. I mean, apart from the fact he was also desperately needy and without my attention would die. Um, he became top of the priority list because of that. But he was, <laughs> and this is, this is George, red mug, red pencils, and George loved that color more than anything else. Um, I used to keep the rubber bands from the mail. The post used to come in, wrapped up in rubber bands and they're all red and I'd keep them in a bowl and they kept vanishing. And I thought my husband, my then husband was using them for something and uh, never bothered to ask the question. And one day I had the occasion to climb on top of the bookcase in the kitchen to, <laughs> to find something rather disgusting that George had taken up there. And there were all these rubber bands, red rubber bands that George had hidden. And George liked to throw these pencils on the floor and the dogs would turn them into toothpicks in minutes. As he got older, I realized that I wanted to keep him. This, this thing that gave me um, a focus in life beyond any focus the dogs had been able to give me because of his need and because of this, what I perceived um, as a really um, co a real connection, <laughs> Um, I didn't want him to go. And the idea that he might fly, which is ultimately, if we love something, we have to be prepared to let it go. And looking after anything from nature, from the wild, and then having to let it go is very good practice. I mean, our friends, our pets, our families, we borrow them, and then we have to let them go. They either die or they move on. And um, we can't legislate, we can't control that sort of thing but we can make the most of what we have while we have it. George really did take my tea bag out of the tea cup. He was, um, as I say, he was a, a tremendous companion, but he was also developing bad habits. He'd do things like take all the knives out of the knife block and drop them on the floor for the dogs to play with. So it's a little macabre. One day I came in and he and the dogs had absolutely decimated the kitchen. Kitchen roll, boxes of tissues, um, matches, total destruction, at which point I began to think that, uh, oh, that and a habit of hiding dog shit from the dog boxes. The dogs were litter trained and hiding dog shit from the dog boxes under the sofa cushions, bad. One time I could have probably used him as a tennis ball and a fast serve. Um, fortunately, I resisted. After two months, George could fly and I knew I was going to have to let him go and I was dreading it. I mean, seriously, um, worried about this because he had made a big big place in my heart for himself however I prepared I steeled myself and at two months I opened the kitchen window and sort of pretty much had to toss him out and off he went after a bit of a stumble and a bit of a flap 
and I was distraught. I was truly upset. And then he came back and then he went and then he came back and then he went. Now, bear in mind that I was creating my dream in the garden. My father, Ted Hughes, had never stayed still when I was a very young child and I had dreamed of putting down roots. And here I was putting down roots. In fact, I could say that George was one of my roots, albeit temporary. Um, I did not want to move again. Um, in fact, I haven't moved in years. I'm going to stay here for as long as possible. Um, George started um, a sort of, he set up a pattern of coming back every night. And when I was out in the garden, he would be with me most of the time, certainly for the first month of his flying free. But at night, he'd come back, perch on the um, door of the kitchen and go to sleep. I'd pop him in a cage and there he'd be. George was quite getting quite, quite a lot older by now. And um, as you can see, I don't know whether you'd call that love or whether he just thought I was a fence post, but this habit set up a problem. And there I was absolutely smitten by this bird and my neighbors weren't. Well, some, several of them were, that's, that's not fair. Several of them were, several of them loved George. And to my envy, my jealousy, I should never be jealous, jealous, wasted emotion. I was a little jealous when I discovered that George had been doing the rounds of the neighbors and making friends in other households with one notable exception. And unfortunately that notable exception was an elderly woman, Jean, who lived next door, who I was desperately fond of. And I would not want to, I would not have wanted to um, worry Jean at all for any reason. And George terrified her. She did not like birds anyway. And George had this habit of landing on people's heads. Normally, he'd pace around the floor at your feet and then bounce off your head and then leave you in peace. If it was me, he'd just come and sit and stay. Uh, I think I got a, I think my shoulder got a bit small for him and my head was a better landing place. Jean finally confesses to me one day, the neighbors, one or two of the neighbors had let me know that she was a bit worried. And I realized I was gonna have to build an aviary. If he wouldn't fly, I couldn't let him fly free for very much longer because I couldn't um, have Jean being made a prisoner in her own house. She'd taken to wearing a hat just to get in the car and lived in fear. As she put it, Frida, I can't tell your magpie from any other wild ones. And I realized how bad it was. So I set about building the biggest aviary I have, big enough for Eurasian eagle owls. This is Eddie here. George flew off to another life after five months, almost to the day, I think he flew like a month and a day after I had found him. And I realized I had a gigantic magpie shaped hole in my, in my life. And people realized I had a big aviary. And I kept telling people I had a big aviary that was empty. And so I found, first it started with a, an Bengal eagle owl with a broken wing. And I found that there were people who couldn't keep owls any longer. Captive bred owls needed homes sometimes. And I had this big aviary. And because of George, <laughs> I now have 13 owls. Um, I can't really show you, but at the moment I have a, um, a snowy owl sitting on a perch in the corner of the kitchen. I wish I could show you. I'd like to lift this up and take, take it there, but I fear I may lose you and I live in Wales and I may lose reception. Um, but Widver um, has the run of the kitchen and utility. And I have a massive aviary with six Eurasians. I have a couple of white-faced Scots owls, a tiny Tengman owl with a little crooked feet and three barn owls that came from a zoo that could no longer house them. So I have developed, because of George, a passion. I never thought of owls. They came to me and they came to me because of George. I blame him in to totally. <laughs> Um, and I, um, I just wanted to share this with you. I, I had such fun writing this book and I hope you enjoy reading it just as much. And um, thank you all very much for watching and listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frida. And thank you for introducing us to George. And thank you to all of our fantastic speakers tonight.
to Tim, to Jenny, to Patrick, to Colin and Frida. All of you have taken us on such a journey and uh, these powerful talks. It's It's been such a pleasure to spend this hour and a bit in your company. Please do follow up and buy our speakers' books. They are all available from New and Bookshop, and the information is there now in the chat. You'll also receive a reading list from us tomorrow, so do keep your eyes peeled for that. We have two events at 5 by 15 next week. On Monday, we'll be hosting the final event in our series with Rathbones on the four elements. The fire panel is being held at 6 p.m. on Monday, and we have an excellent lineup of speakers, including Guy Vince and Melissa Sterry, who will be in discussion about why fire is fundamental to our planet, both destructive and life-giving, and why its functions and its dangers are only becoming more important by the day. If you don't want to miss that, register via our website. We're also going to be doing another event in person at Fennec next week in their Bond Street store, hosted by the brilliant Yomi Adegake. This discussion between four panellists, among them poets, journalists, psychologists and activists, will shed light on what it means to live authentically. We hope to see you there. Thank you again for being with us and good night.